come from the great ecumenical movement that forged ahead after World War II, tied to synergies and spin-offs of the global faith and order movement and then the World Council of Churches. So how is it that ecumenical achievement and ecclesial depletion seem to go hand in hand? Not long ago, a prominent theologian of the church named Michael Root who has been much engaged over many years in Protestant Catholic dialogue, dubbed our moment one, as he put it, of, quote, ecumenical winter, unquote. This characterization was meant to be in contrast to, as he put it, the heyday of ecumenism. Root opened an article on this topic with an account of the vociferous resistance given in the 19th century Vatican I conference to any suggestion that Catholics had something to learn from Protestants. That was the mid 19th century. Root then went on and contrasted this still belligerent inter-ecclesial attitude with the second Vatican Council suggestion, 100 years later, that Catholics really did have something to learn from Protestants, even about the theological matters as central as faith and justification. One of the official Lutheran observers at the time at the Vatican II conference, my own teacher, George Limbeck, began to weep openly when this suggestion was made by some prominent Catholics. The 1960s, the 1970s, even the 1980s proved then a heyday in Root's language of dialogue, agreed statements, theological openness, Somehow, though, that enthusiasm has dissipated. And Root comments, quote, the high emotions of mid-20th century ecumenism have given way to predictable gest gestures and general indifference. 50 years ago, ecumenism could make grown men weep. Now, it is mundane, unquote. Now, Root has his own theory about all this, it's based on a view of Christian relations that follows the analogy of Thomas Kuhn's famous outline of how science works. Long periods of, as Kuhn put it, normal science, study, experiment, theorizing, building, testing, rejecting, adjusting, and then moments, punctiliar events of revolution, or as he put it, and it's now part of the general vocabulary, paradigm shifts. It's the same with ecclesial ecumenism, Root wrote. Most of it is normal discussion, study, and work. It doesn't yield dramatic results, just inch by inch progress in understanding. And then moments of sudden change, like the 1960s and 70s. But now we just need, Root says, to slog away at the daily grind of mutual relations, inch by inch. Root may be right in his description, but I think he's mistaken in valorizing it in a way as he does. In fact, we can no longer afford, if ever we did, inch by inch Christian healing of division. The drawn out cost at this time of ecclesial suspicion is far too great. Root is right, however, in his listing of some of the benefits of the paradigm shift, as it were that now gives rise to normal ecumenical gestures. Atlantic School of Theology, for instance, is a wonderful and concrete example of the fruit of a paradigm shift that's worth engaging inch by inch, surely. Ironically, however, it is just these gestural benefits that have subverted depth of ecclesial unity in favor of a superficial calm, as Root goes on to argue. And I quote again from his article, among Protestants, change has been decisive. For the vast majority of the laity, and even for many clergy, the differences among the mainstream Protestant churches have become irrelevant. People move from one Protestant church to another easily today when they move to a new neighborhood or city. Some ecumenical agreements permit clergy from one church to serve in another. 
When two Lutheran seminaries in Pennsylvania merged the other year, a Presbyterian became the new seminary's president, so on, unquote. But the irrelevance of denominational distinctions, as Root puts it, masks a sense that the church's formal life is not that important, and that the church's commitments are at best third line in importance. For, he goes on, I quote, as people move from one Protestant church to another easily, unquote, they do so with dissolving bonds of belonging and conviction. Adherence, perhaps, but much less commitment. Thus, they do so in light of a judgment made about the value of such belonging and convictions. The judgment is that such committed belonging tends to harm rather than help Christian integrity. That is, underlying a lot of indifference about denominational distinctions is self-protection and cynicism. Normal ecumenism often turns out to be upheld by deep currents of resentment. And these prove profoundly unsteady foundations for unity. So let me, now, let me now trace a bit of this resentment and suggest how it represents the ongoing energy of division, even as it presents itself in the calm guise of unity's servant. For underlying recent service agreements and their seeming tie to, dimission, to diminishing commitment is a pervasive and general theology of church unity that has now proven highly problematic. Here, we will get to the topic of pneumatology, the theology of the Holy Spirit, and its role in our assumptions about the church's life more fundamentally. I will be discussing pneumatology and the church in a more focused way in my second talk. But for now, let me simply state the historical fact that the church's unity has, in theological and liturgical practice, generally been tied to the life and work of the Holy Spirit. In creedal terms, we understand this. The confession of the church's oneness, along with her Catholicity and holiness and apostolicity, comes under the confession of the Holy Spirit. Now, I believe in the Holy Spirit, and then comes uh, the one holy Catholic and apostolic church under that heading. Making uh, the theological study of the church what some people today call literally, third article ecclesiology. Ecclesiology comes under the heading of the Holy Spirit. The church being somehow all about the Holy Spirit. The claim is venerable. It's not just modern. And derives from a basic assumption we make about the Holy Spirit in the church, which in traditional terms has been mostly convergent among churches of varying stripes and traditions, including liberal and conservative ones today. It, 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 I'm not saying it's founded on literally, but it's coherent with the foundational statement of St. Irenaeus, which many of us know. Quote, for where the church is, there is the Spirit of God. And where the Spirit of God is, there is the church and every kind of grace. Unquote. That's from his um, Against the Heresies. Now, I will not be arguing that Irenaeus is wrong in making this claim. But I will be suggesting, not just in this first talk, uh, but as I move on Thursday to some more constructive remarks, that the assertion, as it has been put to use, has been highly misleading. For instance, where the church is, there is the spirit and vice versa. What are we talking about? Any church? In any place? Even if we have assumed this, theoretically, we have in practice denied it ever rejigging the terms of grace itself according to our sense of experiential contradiction. And by experience, by the way, in this talk, I simply mean taking history seriously, being somehow consciously in a self-aware fashion affected by the phenomena of the temporal world. Hence, what I'm arguing is simply that we take seriously the fact that our experience alters and has always altered how we identify what the church is, period. Um, so there are obvious scriptural examples where the phenomenon of history, as it were, seem to challenge a set of theological assumptions. If you are the son of God, save yourself, they say to Jesus on the cross. And obviously, if you don't, you're not. 
or from the disciples' sides, and we thought he was the one to redeem Israel. Israel's not redeemed, thus he was not it, the Messiah. One assumes that Messiahship entails this or that, and when something particular happens that does not cohere with these assumptions, one must readjust. More prosaically, if spectacularly, there are things like, I don't know, the children's crusade of the early 13th century, shrouded in uncertainty, but in the end, giving rise to incredulity amongst both participants and historians when all of them never made it, died, drowned, disappeared. Or the strange hopes placed on Sabbatai Seville in the 17th century, a Jewish messianic expectation that swept Eastern and Southern Europe, but that crumbled in the face of his failures and indeed pathetic final conversion to Islam, of all things. We made a mistake about our expectations, might be one reaction. Or there was never anything there in the first place, nor could there be, would be a more extreme response. There are various possible reorientations to be made in the middle. But church history is littered with these assumptions, experiential contradictions, and then readjustments to belief as a result. In fact, though, much reaction to historical experience in the church is unconscious, though extraordinarily elaborate and even conceptually rich. That is, we respond to experience, especially negative experience, by reconstructing its framework in our minds and judgment. The theory of cognitive dissonance is perhaps the most influential conceptual portal into this reality that I believe has framed much of church history from the ground up. Most of us take the motivating dynamics of cognitive dissonance for granted these days. But when in 1956, Leon Festinger and his colleagues Henry Reekin and Stanley Schachter published a book entitled When Prophecy Fails, their claims basically settled a general perception that stands to the present. Fessinger and his collaborators studied a small group of persons in Chicago who followed a woman who claimed to have special communications with extraordinarily intelligent planetary aliens. These communications included a predicted earthly catastrophe. I don't know if you've ever read the book. It's, it's worth reading. The study focused on how the group responded in the face of the failed prophecy. A major hypothesis that Festinger and company upheld was the failure, utterly dissonant with the group's expectations and now congealed identity, uh, rather than dissolving their commitments, somehow confirmed them and led the group to great public self-assertion. That's to say, they believed in this coming catastrophe, it didn't happen, and instead of giving up on the whole uh, movement, they actually rejigged their expectations so as to prove that they were really right in the first place, even though they appeared not to have been fulfilled. Now, that wasn't true for everybody, um, uh, not for all members of the group, for some of whom the unfulfilled disaster simply subverted their previous convictions altogether and bred much uh, broad disillusion. Whatever the shortcomings of the experiment, and has been criticized on several fronts, the basic arguments informing the notion of cognitive dissonance have stood firm and been developed into broader areas of rationalization and confirmation bias in a range of contexts. Now the fact that cognitive dissonance theory was first formulated by Leon Festinger and his colleagues with religious convictions in mind is no accident. I think that's really important to understand. When Prophecy Fails, uh, the book, uh, it opens with a long chapter on, quote, unfulfilled prophecies and disappointed messiahs, unquote. Moving from Montanus, quickly through Anabaptist, Kiliasm, Jewish Sabbateanism, as I mentioned, and the Baptist Adventism of 19th century Millerites in their progeny. Dissonance, disconfirmation, rationalization, and adjustment. All these things have followed these kinds of disappointed 
messiahs and expectations within the Christian tradition and in other religious traditions. I was actually introduced to the book in graduate school by a Jewish social philosopher who wanted us to consider whether the scapegoating of Jews in the Middle Ages was a product, or you could even say project, of belief adjustment by Christians in the face of unrealized Christian hopes of one kind or another. They didn't pan out, so we we're going to take it out on somebody else. The point's not frivolous. Much theological work of a certain kind, it seems, to me, is indeed driven unconsciously by the dissonance of experience with religious claims. This comes with varied results, of course, but they include those of elaborated rationalizations, that is, developing otherwise unobvious theological claims as a means of explicating or justifying or resolving dissonance, and of energized oppositions as well, that is, blame others. Now, the theological work of a certain kind that I have in mind here is ecclesiology in particular, <laughs> theology of the church. I think it's just driven by cognitive dissonance and the rationalizations that emerge from that. But pneumatology, theology of the Holy Spirit as well. Um, it's sort of what I'm doing, I have to admit that. Uh, but I suggest in any case that we pause to consider the pressures of what one might call ecclesial dissonance and its related category of pneumatic dissonance in this light. So for instance, we might reflect on certain common anecdotal observations which seem to be backed up by unadorned behavioral statistics. Thus, it seems that many Christians treat the church today with far less patience than they do their own families and civil polities. Not always, of course, but usually and in quotidian terms. That is, Christians seem far readier to leave their churches or their congregations or denominations than they do to abandon their families or to emigrate or renounce their citizenships. Major religious research groups like the Pew Forum or the Barna Group back this up, at least for North America. 35% of adult Americans have different religious affiliations now than they were raised with in their youth. Over 40% are members of different denominations. 40% of Christians actually church hop as their regular practice, which is defined by going to different churches uh, maybe two or three times a month, uh, different congregations for their worship. 40%. Uh, and almost 20% change denominational affiliations every four years. Amongst Catholics and Protestants both, the major reason for adherence and membership instability has been disappointment with their given church's moral witness, something that takes in things like stands on social issues, uh, as well as leadership behavior, including sexual abuse and financial impropriety. A recent book has been making waves. You might have heard of it or even read it, The Great Dechurching. Who's leaving? Where, why are they going? And what will it take to bring them back? It's by uh, several um, evangelical pastors and scholars. Um, and it lays out a set, of, uh, a set of groups, they call them clusters, who have left U.S. churches in the past two decades. Up to 40 million people have been studied and followed and put into these clusters. A little less than half of these 40 million are evangelicals, and almost all of them, for different reasons, are driven by dissatisfactions and angers at teaching, behavior, abuse, misogyny, racism, hypocrisy, infantilization, greed, politics of one kind or another. Those are the main reasons given for dissatisfaction with their churches and leaving them. Indeed, the whole category of those, quote, wounded by the church, unquote, is sprawling. Uh, there's a recent uh, article about this that lays it out. Percentage of U.S. adults suffering from religious trauma, a sociological study. Uh, it's quite uh, astonishing, really, to look at what's involved in all of this. And this is uh, just this year this was published. Um, but it's interesting that the category wounded by the church 
was itself not identified as such until the 1990s. Before that, wounds and church, those two uh, lexical uh, clusters, um, were joined together in terms of the expected cost of discipleship. You were wounded by being a faithful Christian in the church. That was, that was how the two uh, concepts were joined. But by the 1990s, the church as victimizer and the church member as victim suddenly, and I mean suddenly, becomes a topic of widespread discussion. That is, just as the great ecumenical leap forward had, we are told, taken place. Which makes one wonder if the leap itself was not a bit of an illusion kindled by darker fires. And thus, the disappointment that fuels de-churching, to use this phrase, now uh, common usage, seems to be tied specially to disillusionment, the crushed promises of some earlier hope. Most of us are familiar with older pastors and priests whose disillusionment with ecclesial politics and related matters often leads to their distance and indifference to ecclesial life more broadly in their retirement and sometimes even significantly limits their participation in the church during these years. This often includes their families as well. It is not uncommon among lay and ordained Christians to hear the comment associated with their peregrinations and estrangements of, as I indicated a moment ago, I was hurt by the church. Those who enter the ministry in this case with high hopes and ideals often discover something discordant with their expectations. Based on bare statistics, as it were, it is safe to say that perhaps even a majority of AST's graduates will experience this, as do those of most seminaries like Wycliffe College. But it turns out that the disillusionment, this disillusionment, is historically and intimately bound up with a particular unfulfilled hope, such that disaffection with the church today seems to grow out of and give rise to the particular disappointment that a divided church specifically engenders. Indeed, I want to stress how unity itself is one of the greatest foci of felt dissonance that is experienced by um, the disaffected, shall we say, of today. Schism, division, and sometimes in the past, rather often, outright violent conflict. I've had a long-standing interest in this particular topic historically and theologically. It is established, I believe anyway, that the rise of deism and finally explicit atheism in the 18th century, a little, perhaps not as much as has been assumed, but certainly in the 19th century, the rise of atheism, Gnosticism, and the rest is related directly to an unquenchable dissatisfaction over the internal disputes and outrages perpetrated among Christians. You can trace this very clearly. It's a complicated story to be sure, tied often obscurely to the disseminating sense of ecclesial complicity in a range of other ills for which division was a coalescing symbol. Christians killing other Christians and killing non-Christians being the summit of it. The twistedness of such division, not only in driving people away from the church, but also in forming their larger habits, even when once the church is given up, along the lines of ongoing social divisiveness, is well outlined by the historian Clarence Gowen in his now classic volume, Broken Churches, Broken Nation, Denominational Schisms, and the Coming of the American Civil War, 1985, a book I commend to everyone to understand that the American Civil War was not just about slavery. It took a while for the breadth of this destructive and larger social dynamic to be recognized. But by the 20th century, ecclesial disunity had become almost axiomatically a sign of moral corruption, rightly so in my mind. The pressure of this recognition, however, is unbearable given the reality of ecclesial separations that are just endemic and certainly have been and were at the beginning of the 20th century still. 
that is the power of dissonance at work. If Christian division is horrendously immoral, but also impervious to correction, what are the implications? Theologically, ecclesially, religiously, psychologically, anthropologically. The experience of ecclesial dissonance in the face of division, of course, gives rise to a variety of reactions. I've mentioned a few already. Oddly, these do not seem to include the press to greater unity in quotidian practical terms by most Christians. It turns out that the great ecumenical moment of the mid-20th century was less a punctuated paradigm shift, but rather a blip. For following along on the reactive drive of dissonance and disillusion, the diminishing churches of today's West turn out also to be yet more highly vulnerable to division itself. As we see right now with Methodism, Lutheranism, Anglicanism, the Southern Baptists, just for starters. Uh, not to mention hard to chart free angelical splinterings that seem to have continued unabated from the start. That is to say, we are actually dividing more <laughs> right now, literally, even though we seem to think it doesn't matter that much. But the bulk of the division of the church today is pursued individually. As members shift their allegiance from one church to another, or as I have noted, more simply, drop out altogether. So in every case, this is the point, carrying their self-perpetuating adversarial disappointments with them. Not just into churches and new churches, but into the social sphere and the secular sphere more broadly. And finally, giving rise to a kind of global distaste for Christianity as a whole in a way that transcends that dissonance of disunity. As it now stands, the largest reason given by those who have dropped out of church affiliation is simply, I don't even believe any of it anymore. As to say, I was hurt by the church, has moved inexorably to, I don't think it even means anything. Now, in one way, it is important to keep the categories of ecclesial and pneumatic dissonance separate. To say the church is not what I expected or we expected is a judgment about human action and its failures. But to say the Holy Spirit is not what I or we expected is a judgment about our failure to understand who God is, something that may prove yet more frightening than ecclesial corruption. But the two, nonetheless, ecclesial and pneumatic dissonance, are practically conflated leading to radical swings of commitment and relationship. While we are more prone to blame the church, it is still rare to blame the Holy Spirit. Instead, we blame the Holy Spirit's contradiction, some that is easily, psychologically speaking, bound up with theologies of pneumatic unity. That is, convictions about the nature of ecclesial unity that are disconfirmed can be adjusted by a now refashioned evaluation of God and God's pneumatic promises. We can say, for instance, in the face of ecclesial disunity and disappointment, they, the others, the people I was once part of but no longer am, they were not real Christians. They were not fully led by the Spirit. They misconstrued the Spirit's unifying grasp that transcends dogma and morals altogether. And most recently, they didn't understand how the Holy Spirit transcends institutions in an absolute way. And here in this last rationalization, the paradox of today's um, calmer ecclesial landscape existing alongside an imploding ecclesial integrity is given an explanatory form, one that has become increasingly uh, attractive to contemporary Christians disappointed in the church. The Holy Spirit, many now believe, the Holy Spirit himself embodies the de-churching, indeed the departicularizing of Christianity and does so positively for the sake of Christian unity itself. That is, one way to cut the Gordian knot of dissonance over Christian disunity is to eliminate churches altogether and to embrace 
a spiritual religion, undefined or unlinked with concrete institutions and human relationships. This adjustment to pneumatic dissonance, as tied and consequent to ecclesial dissonance, first made its appearance in the 16th century with the so-called radical spiritualist Christian movements that were quite marginal, but it is now utterly commonplace in our society. And this particularly contemporary line of reaction is upheld by certain assumptions that we have long held. And so for the final part of my talk, I want to go back to things I've been saying and revisit the entire issue of ecclesial division and dissonance, which has led to the vacating, if you will, of ecclesial faith altogether, to revisit it on the basis of the formal categories of theology regarding the spirit, about church and spirit and so on, so on, that we tend to assume apply, and that has driven, in my opinion, the cycle of disappointment. So let's step back again in this last portion for a moment and consider the more formal theological frameworks that we have in place and within which just these kinds of reactions I've been talking about find their normal theological uh, outworking. We can approach them by seeing how they answer the central question. By what do we measure the unity of the church? How do we know if the Christian church is one or at one? Though we claim the church to be one in the Nicene Creed, I believe one holy Catholic church, we also are able to identify quite concretely division, schism, and heresy when it takes place. So we believe. So we believe the church is one, and we believe the church is also divided. We do this practically, and it's built into our theological language and vocabulary and conceptualities. Do these divisions actually affect ecclesial unity, which we claim we confess, or are they only accidents that represent humanly subjective experiences, but in fact do nothing to touch the thing in itself, ecclesial unity? Just as looking at the sun may injure the eyes so that uh, we can no longer see the light, though the sun's light remains as full as ever. So division appears to uh, sort of... Uh, muddy the waters of Christian unity as we observe them, but Christian unity is always there. Historically, Christians have not been consistent in how they have answered this difficult question, theologically, and questions related to it. They have tended intellectually, theologically, to side with the subjective misperception thesis. Experience disunity does not actually affect the real unity of the church. That's been the theological standard. But in mutual practice, Christians have erected an array of shifting measures of unity that, as it were, have sought to assert objective correlations between human perception of division and divine reality. To take woefully broadly, I admit the Reformed case as an example of just how this has worked out. 16th and early 17th century discussions of ecclesial unity by Reformed theologians applied the measure of doctrinal conformity to defining ecclesial unity. The church can be seen as one insofar as doctrinal claims among Christians are, in fact, one, agreed, held in common. By the latter 17th and into the 18th century, however, this shifted amongst Reformed um, thinkers, at least some of them. And in some reform circles like John Owen and um, Edwards um, to a kind, it shifted to a kind of, from doctrine to a kind of affective measure, increasingly individual and practically speaking increasingly obscure. That is, while doctrinal conformity was viewed as a necessary condition for ecclesial unity, it increasingly came to be viewed as insufficient Indeed, it might even prove deceptively insufficient, if not founded on a deeper, affective condition of faith, often identified in terms of a certain kind of love, and in fact, often linked directly to the work or presence of the Holy Spirit. You couldn't really be sure you were one with another Christian unless you shared 
this pneumatic charity, which was somehow, and that was the question, somehow measurable, maybe, sometimes. But identifying this condition, you see, became admittedly difficult. So by the 20th century, the larger drift of reform thinking has been both to reaffirm the givenness of ecclesial unity, the church really is one, as well as to further muddy the subjective manifestations of such unity. What does it actually look like and feel like? A recent international reformed Anglican dialogue statement on koinonia, communion, from 2020, speaks of koinonia as, quote, fundamental, as, quote, complex, as, quote, multidimensional, as, quote, challenging, as, quote, eschatological, or sort of not yet, and an incorruptible, nonetheless divine, quote, gift. All of these at once. Unity is lodged in the unchangeable integrity of, quote, the body of Christ, which, though received variously, is never threatened. That's the general drift. And you can see how we got there, in a way. It became harder and harder to hold on to these little distinct measures. Um, and thus, the Episcopal Church Book of Common Prayer of 1979, Book of Common Prayer of my church, ha has as part of one of its Eucharistic prayer, letter D, the petition, quote, remember, Lord, your one holy Catholic and apostolic church, redeemed by the blood of your Christ, reveal its unity, guard its faith, and preserve it in peace. Reveal it. It's there. Show us what is already there. The conviction that the church really is united amidst all the chances and changes of Christian history, which is thus rendered a mosaic of colorful contrasts and variations, is now, that is, an ecumenical commonplace. The end result is a kind of optimistic, laissez-faire approach to ecclesial division. Well, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's diversity in unity. It's multicolored. It is a mosaic. But we're all actually really one, so we don't have to press these particularities and their meaning too hard. Um, and I would say that this laissez-faire, I use the term deliberately, approach to ecclesial division mirrors the general current of free market toleration, seasoned with a certain amount of earnest moral concern. As we know, however, this shift to the communion of moral earnestness often pushes back towards a demand for a particular praxis-oriented uh, conformity, as it were, that leaves us just where we started with, measuring who is in and who is out, although now based on whether one is for or against this or that political or moral issue. My own Anglican tradition, though it has its own quite specific elements that, as we know, have pressed against the Reformed tradition that originally gave it birth, we have bishops in the threefold ministry. Uh, we accept dogmatic modesty, if not actual latitude, and so on, uh, in contrast to many Reformed traditions. My own Anglican tradition has followed a similar tra tra trajectory, nonetheless, because after all, it joined the World Communion of Reformed Churches in the statement I've just mentioned. Behind this drift, though, is a long history of struggles. Puritans and high church and royalists and uh, constitutionalists and so on, buffetings, reassessments, rearticulations in the midst of British history and social change, and now global demographic rearrangements. The basic question of the truth value in divine terms of this process has never really been examined. That is to say, is all this providence? And if it's providence, how do we identify it? Is it unity at work, as it were, in some fashion? Have churches simply, in our day, penetrated more deeply into the true character of Christian unity over time, such that older claims about unity, based on doctrine or structure or charity, have been unveiled as ignorant? It's an interesting question of what agreed statements amount to, you see. 
Is it new knowledge? Is it recognition of old knowledge that has been obscured? I mean, the Catholic, Oriental, Coptic uh, agreed statements on the nature of Christ in the last few decades. Uh, after 1,700 years of mutual anathema, were described the problems as a misunderstanding in history. Um, a misunderstanding, of course, giving rise to mutual cursing. So the question is, what does that add up to with respect to unity? Is it just a misperception? Or has unity itself been altered? Was it always there? Or has it been achieved? And it wasn't there once and now is in some way. If we are in a new place that God has ordered, what is God's providential purpose amounted to in the course of division, schism, heresy, and violence and conflict that these have given rise to over the centuries? Part of my personal sense is that this kind of question touches as much upon our conceptions of God's character as it does upon our refashioned ecclesial self-construals. And that's what I'm going to talk about uh, on Thursday, a different way of understanding the character of God, in particular, the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit obviously arises here immediately given the topic. What kind of God and through what character divine action is at work in this long tradition of antagonism, fracture, and sometimes violence? The long Christian press for identifiable and practical metrics of ecclesial unity have consistently assumed such unity as having either a stable or an ideal nature, open both to human definition and itself invulnerable ultimately to human decisions. It is an assumption that itself presumes the Holy Spirit's presence as the effective agent of unity and thus as itself a metric of ecclesial integrity. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the one holy Catholic and apostolic church. And of course, this is something that is immovable in its truth and absolute certainty. We think we know what unity is as a result, or ought to be. We know, we think, its pneumatic foundation. And as a result, we know how to measure its demands. These mark the boundaries of our general theological assumptions about unity, and they all depend on a sense of the Holy Spirit's assured presence and work in the church, as well as on that presence and work's accessible apprehension by us. The fact, however, is that this series of certainties and the broader assumptions of what I will call the Spirit's full self-disclosure in ecclesial terms is ever been and has ever been destabilized. That this is what the cyclical dynamic of ecclesial and pneumatic dissonance constitutes is itself a bit of data requiring theological work. The spirit neither makes us one, nor can we apprehend the spirit's work in the making of ecclesial oneness. That is what I think the phenomena of history tells us. What then shall we say about our grasp of the church's pneumatic integrity? Remember I said I'm not going to argue that Irenaeus' claim is wrong, only that its application can be misleading. Do we understand even what we are talking about when we say where the spirit is, there is the church in every kind of grace? Indeed, just what grace are we talking about in a world such as the one we live in today? and I need not bring to mind things that we are hearing about every hour at the moment. This is what I propose to address in my second talk. Thank you. Professor Radner, thank you very much. I have a microphone that will travel. We also have people online. Uh, Kevin, are, are you able to see comments if people post them? So I will respond to your signals as well as signals from the room. Uh, comments, questions, criticisms, personal experiences. We'll keep it to the narrow questions first. <laughs> I 
think one of the jobs of a moderator is to have a warm-up question in pocket. So uh, I, I've got one on the, on the point of experience. Um, your supervisor, Lindbeck, wrote kind of famously about the experiential expressive. And I guess I thought about that as sort of like a warning. Don't be too much like this. Uh, in your work, I hear quite a lot of experience, but experience really rooted in the, ex in the experience of disappointment, um, e ecclesial dissonance, pneumatic uh, dissonance. And I'm just curious if you can help me understand a little better the role that experience has in your own work, um, and you can connect it to your you know, pedigree or not. Yeah. Uh, well, with respect to my pedigree, you're quite right about George Limbeck. He would not want to sort of organize uh, a theology based that grows simply out of our experience, or certainly my experience. Um, on the other hand, his ecclesiology was highly experiential, precisely because as an ecumenist, he had to take seriously the historical realities of separated churches uh, and the, the consequences of that, as well as hopes uh, one might have for something different, judgments one might make about it, and projects one might engage in order to it. So he was, he was deeply uh, committed to taking seriously the history of the church. Uh, and history is experience. Now, of course, it's, 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 it, there are lots of different experiences that go into a single thing we call a historical event. That's what makes it very complicated and requires a lot of care and in talking about, but taken as a whole, one can see, one can see a kind of shape in human experience. I'm speaking from a Christian point of view, and to that shape, uh, given our faith in God, we give the, we give the phrase divine providence. Providence is an experiential category, but it's an experiential category that is tempered by and framed by, and must be sort of uh, readjusted to. Um, the reality of a God who we do not control experientially. So it's a tricky thing. We're looking at our experience as something that is ultimately given us and given its meaning by God. So that's a theological project, but it's one that is utterly rooted in creation, the world we live in. Um, that's true for the church. It's true for our own personal lives as well. So, um, yeah, uh, by experience, I mean the historical unfolding of, of the limits of our lives in their relationship one to another. And of course, that's true for us as individuals, but as churches, we know it's in groups. It's more complicated, maybe, to talk about, but it's just as true. Yeah. Can't talk about ecclesiology without talking about history. I think we would like not to do that, but, but it's impossible. Thank you, Professor Radner. I, uh, my name is Julie, and I'm a first-year MDiv student here. And so I'll emphasize the first-year part. <laughs> but I, I was listening um, to your explanation and expressions around unity as a concept, and was glad to hear some of the reference to unity in disunity or unity in multiplicity, and um, some of this sense that the unity is not so simple. And yet, it sounds like maybe for you the unity is still, it's unified in so far as it's transcendent of all these multiple expressions or disunified um, manifestations. But I was reading something recently uh, by Pamela Cooper White, I believe is her name. Mm -hmm. And she was talking about um, uh, an image of the Trinity which is disunified and which is multiple. And in so far, like in the fact that it is thus, then um, it, it can reference individual and personal experience more satisfactorily. And it makes space for things like conflict and for both at an individual and I would say at like more an entity level, like an organization, it makes spent space for um, to have conflicts which are between these parts and yet these other parts can enter into a more harmonious relationship. So I'm wondering if you could um, give us a sense of the type of unity you'll talk so about. So thank you for bringing that up because um, I probably I'm, did give, give um, 
on the tenor of my, my very brief remarks, a sense that, especially at the end when I was uh, quoting from the reformed Anglican uh, statement, that diversity and multidimensionality and complexity and so on is not real unity. Um, I wouldn't want to say that. I would simply want to say we have no idea what it is. <laughs> that is to say, um, where, what's the line between good diversity and bad diversity? Um, because we've had plenty of diversity. The history of the church is one of diversity. It's also one of, as I've been pointing out, tremendous, tremendous um, suffering and, and oppression and all the other things uh, that have been part of the church's history, uh, ultimately um, leading to mutual killing. Um, now, do we, do, we, do we say, I'm just using this as an example, diversity is fine as long as we don't kill each other. No, that, that can't be right either. There's more to it than that. Diversity is great as long as we don't harm each other. Diversity is great as long as we like each other. In the, I mean, I don't know. It's not clear. I don't think diversity is any more ideally um, has any more ideal clarity as to its value than does uniformity. Neither has worked <laughs> in the history of the church. And, I, and, and one of the things I was pointing out is as, as we become far more accepting and tolerant of diversity, we've also, again, there's a question of how and why, have watched our churches disappear. Um, and as I said, they, they, they do seem to go together. So we've got to get it right. Whatever it is, not get it right. But we've got to figure out some kind of parameters in which we apply these concepts such that there is, A, a church to be unified, <laughs> and there is, uh, there is a diversity to be celebrated. Um, I don't believe we know what we're talking about yet well enough to know what that is. That's all. So I, I, I take no side on that particular on that particular question, it is a live question. I will say a little bit in the next, I, I hope you'll see in the next talk, uh, you mentioned conflict and the place of conflict within a uh, faithful Christian life. I will, I will want to say something about that. Yeah. Um, my name is Beth Hayward and I'm an alumni. I've been in this, so I'm going <laughs> to take you to the pastoral weeds here. Um, been at this for nearly 25 years, and um, I have colleagues who, in the face of the reality of the church, have doubled down on doctrine, and let's be clear on what it means to be a disciple. I've taken um, the approach of my congregation of uh, all are welcome to the point of I'm clear where we stand, but come on in and let's see how far we can um, broaden the circle without completely losing the container. And I have a neighbor down the street who said to me recently, I want a church that, that's kind of both of those. I, I want a place that's clear on, on its doctrine and uh, radical in its hospitality and inclusion. And I, I'm just curious if you have some thoughts on, uh, I've seen, you know, with success um, on both ends of that spectrum. Um, I mean, I've had a growing congregation with this, what people would say, well, are you barely Christian? Um, but people are engaged. And, I, and yet I feel like there's, there's a growing edge there that us as pastors need to lean into, that it doesn't look at the dichotomies and somehow finds a new way forward. So, I mean, the, the, the pastoral question is obviously central. Um, but the pastoral question is also being raised and engaged in the midst of a very rich, deep, textured, broad, embracing culture of expectations that far outstrip our individual ability as pastors or as local groups to sort of get a handle on. Um, the book I mentioned that I said a lot of people are talking about, the de-churching, where is it? So I can just give you the uh, author's names. Uh, there's several authors. Um, D. Church, uh, where is it? Anyway, it just came out this year. That, yeah, here we are. Uh, the Great D. Churching, Who's Leaving, Why They're Going, and What Will It Take to Bring Them Back? It's the last one, which, a phrase, 
which is one of the major motivating elements of the book. Um, the authors are Jim Davis, Michael Graham, Ryan Burge, and their whole point in laying out all these statistics about why people have left and the reasons is so that we have a way to possibly understand how to bring them back if we respond to this thing or that thing or that thing that has disappointed them. Um, you know, if I said that I think that's probably unrealistic, it's not because I want to discourage a, a, a response uh, that is born of, of Christian conviction and love for people to sort of find a place where people can be uh, drawn in and encounter the living God. I, I, we have to do these sorts of things. I doubt there are rules about how to do it. And I doubt that in the face of, as I said, this very complex culture we're in, that that many people will be satisfied by this or that particular response to their felt need as they've articulated it. I think a, a question that I think pastors, and again, I'm going to talk about it next, next lecture, uh, so I want to keep my powder dry, as it were, a little bit. But, but as I mentioned at the end, a real question pastors need to think about is not how can I get people back, but who is the God I'm bringing them to such that this has been their life, this is the life of the church we have, and this is how we find our, this is how it is we find our place within it now. Who is this kind of God? Not the God I want, not the God they want, but the God who has ordered things to this place in this, because I think then one can, one can, if one loves such a God, <laughs> which I think one, one would if one recognizes such a God as God, one can, one can share something about that. And that ultimately will be the strongest, uh, you know, in, in the broad sense, evangelical, you know, good, good news power uh, that one can express. Um, so I'm, I'm, not, I'm not dismissing what you're talking about as trying to find these two things because people want them. But I think it's, you got, we have to go even behind that somehow and have a, a, a greater sense of the living God who is behind all of that. Thank you, Professor Radner. I'm uh, Father Benjamin von Bredo from uh, the Anglican Parish of Shelburne on the South Shore of Nova Scotia here. You spoke about, statistically, how most people are saying that their disappointment with the church is coming out of uh, disunity itself and out of moral failure, and that that is correlated with uh, decreasing commitment. What I see among, uh, you might say, highly committed circles in the church, right? I'm clergy, I have many clergy friends, seminary friends, um, are, is disillusionment being born out of the very failure of the church to uh, maintain its own standards is one of the ways it's often talked about. We think about our fracturing Anglican communion, um, where, which is where a lot of the, the disunity is being driven by a sense that there are some people who want to restore standards. Um, which seems to be driving in a different direction, driving towards higher commitment, but perhaps greater fractiousness. Does, um, does that drive and that source of disillusionment illuminate something about the situation in terms of uh, Christian unity and, and what the data is that we need to explore theologically? No, I, I, I think you're right uh, on everything you said, including greater commitment in our uh, time, and probably many times, not just now, but certainly now, also leads to greater fractiousness. That, that's, so th th there are different responses, if you will, to ecclesial dissonance. They're not all the same. Um, I think it is true that one of the general responses within sort of those who are interested in the greater ecumenical project, uh, say church unity, has been in fact to ex inflate the Holy Spirit's breadth and reach as to departicularize matters, uh, whether of doctrine or standards, whatever. I think that's a broader trend. But there is definitely also the trend that would retrench um, in one way or another. You see that in, in I mean, there's a great attraction amongst uh, certain um, younger people to the 
PCA, the Presbyterian Church of America, for doing that, you know, Tim Keller and so on, that whole movement, um, certain forms of conservative Roman Catholicism, as well as Methodism and so on. This draws some very strong and passionate um, new members into its ranks, especially amongst the young. I don't think there's any sense, though, that this is a burgeoning movement. Uh, it is one among many in a smaller reaction. So you, you're right, they're going in different directions, but I think they're part of the same larger phenomenon of this dissonance. People do react differently when things aren't as they expected or wanted. Um, and they can, you know, quite, quite contradictory uh, responses. But they're all responses, nonetheless. And, you know, the notion of a, um, I don't know, as an Anglican of a certain kind of, you know, the, 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 the Oxford movement itself was already a form, in my view, for all of its virtues and rediscoveries and gifts. It was nonetheless born out of a sense of dissonance. I mean, it, even in its most, um, what do I want to say, um, iconic, however, well, and quite accurate, I think, uh, uh, iconic moments of foundation where Keeble preaches the Assai sermon about how, you know, everything's going to hell in a handbasket in Britain and the, the church no longer has any cultural and governmental um, established uh, roots and foundations any longer, so we have to do something different. Now, he didn't put it that way, but many, many of those who followed did, and and so, you know, even that was a form of, of response to dissonance. Um, so, such it's, so it has been, um, although I think modernity has more of these movements. Um, I mean, the Reformation itself, sort of the invention, well, Franciscanism, you could say. But anyway, it, it goes back a long time, these sorts of reactive. And by reactive, it doesn't mean they're wrong. It just means that they're part of a, they're part of a historical matrix. They don't just happen because of a illumination of a truth. I don't think so. I have a question for clarification. Oh, I'm Annette Brownlee. I am on the faculty of Wycliffe College, and I am married to this guy. <laughs> so it's a question of uh, clarification, um, and maybe I just need you to connect the dots more for me. Speaking of uh, the many reasons people are leaving the church in the West now, referring to the book, um, they all cohered around disappointment in all the things you've been talking about, and a dissonance between what they had hoped the church would be and the reality of the experience of the church, right? Is that a good summary? Yeah. Okay. But then you speak, and then you speak about sort of uh, the disunity or the dissonance of unity within the ch larger church. And that in, you cited the sort of shocking statistics of how many uh, churches people go to, how often they switch churches uh, to partially uh, argue that uh, sort of any kind of unity just isn't on people's radar. Is that a fair summary? Right, and, and, and part of that is because unity itself has lost traction as something that has substance. Yes. So I'm a little con uh, I need a little help in, in better understanding the, the connection between the two, the, the, the dissonance in people's experience of the church that is making them leave, um, and the, the important focus on the lack of unity in the church, whatever it means, um, and how the yeah. two are connected. Right, I, I don't think it's a, uh, the dots don't connect in a simple logical line. Um, the whole sort of, if you will, which I buy, theory, a psychological theory of cognitive dissonance, 
is that people and, and individuals are all different. People have to find a way to live with what doesn't compute in their convictions in this case. And people will find different ways of doing that. And um, more than that, one can sort of develop habits of sort of, of, uh, of dealing with that dissonance, which then color not in only individually, but in a group and more broadly culturally, these sorts of things. So you have the dissonance of disunity. <laughs> the church is meant to be one, but it's divided. Now one way you could deal with that is to say, so I'm going to work to reconcile all the divisions. And some people do that. I mean, the ecumenical movement is in part fueled by the desire to reconcile that which is broken because what is broken hurts in some way. But as we know, that, 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 that would be logical in a way. Um, but there are all kinds of reasons why that logic is not personally or socially um, achievable, pursuable. Um, we, we all know experiences where we, instead of fixing something that we've messed up or that has gotten messed up for us, we throw it away. And we do that all the time. Um, and it turns out that that's a very common way to deal with it. Or we redefine it as never having been important in the first place. I made a mistake. I gave my life to ecumenical work. And it turns out you know, I didn't get anywhere. And it turns out I was just wrong. It's not that important. There are better things. And, you know, I, God doesn't care. You know, that's actually become a very common view now. Um, so it's not a logical line. but. You can, you can give up on unity even though your deep disappointment is with disunity. That's one way of dealing with that disappointment, is to say it's not based on something real. Um, um, I never really wanted that degree anyway, you know. <laughs> I failed that course. It was a stupid course, <laughs> you know. Um, people do that all the time. We're very close to time. Maybe question, we have time for one more. Kevin, is there anybody online? Okay. Anybody? Uh, okay. Hi, um, my name is Katie. I'm married to that one over there, so you can call me Mrs. Father Von Brader <laughs> if you like. Um, but uh, I've been thinking about um, the secular age, where he talks about um, how it's, we no longer have the choice of sort of unconscious faith, um, that we're stuck in this sort of Nietzschean choice, um, which seems to match on to what you're saying about the fractious nature of the church, um, that whether you leave the church or leave to another church or even decide to remain in your own church, you're stuck in this loop of making a statement or making a choice, which seems to contradict um, what I find so beautiful about Mary receiving the Holy Spirit, receiving Christ, that um, I sing often to my daughter, uh, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see our God, um, that there seems to be an attitude of reception and humility and obedience that contradicts the Nietzschean sort of uh, framework of choice that we're forced into um, in this particular moment in history. Um, and so I guess my question is whether or not you think it's possible to uh, have a pure heart as a Christian today, um, or whether the fractiousness of the church has sort of taken that away from us in this particular moment. Well, uh, yeah, what a, what a, it's a, a profound uh, uh, question and profoundly important. And this issue of choice, I, I mentioned how people are far more prone to leave churches than they are to leave their country or their citizenship or even their family. Um, and that is true, and one of the reasons is um, church division itself invented ecclesial choice as a as a necessity. Not initially, because then you, you, had, you had regional you know, uniformity of uh, churches in many places, 
But it set in motion in a very real and almost immediate way um, the need for individuals, you think of England in the 16th century and Catholics and Protestants and then conformists and Puritans and so on. Uh, and then when you had the act of toleration in the late 18, uh, 17th century in England, um, the civil authority ordered in some sense, even though it was only gradual, but nonetheless established choice as something that was protected by law because it was necessary. Choice for churches, I'm talking about. So um, ecclesial division and the Western and Western choice making, um, I don't want to say they're, the, the, they're exclusively related to one another, but the division of the church has a huge role to play, I believe, in the along with other things, mobility and, and urbanization and so on and so forth. Um, so is it possible today, um, you know, everybody who decides to join the true church has made a decision uh, and, and is a church shopper of one kind or another, how, however, um, however much they have integrity in their thinking and so on. And part of, they're just with everybody else. All, every church member, who is it who, you know, has, grew up in a church and stays in that church and purely takes it in like the water they breathe their whole of their life. I don't know that that is possible for anybody in the Western world any longer. So, what, so purity of heart might mean something different than this kind of clear, unobstructed, un kind of cogitating, self-conscious thought about the church. Uh, it might mean something else. It might have meant that once, in a way. Um, but I'm not sure, uh, it's an interesting uh, question, is how has purity of heart changed its vocation, its vocational contours in the modern age? But I'm not sure it's the same one. We're not gonna get back to the one church, established church, that we don't have to worry about because we're born in it and we die in it. Um, that's just not possible socially right now. It's not possible anywhere in the world as far as I know. It's not possible in Russia. They would love it to be uh, the case in Russia. And we see where that has gotten things, right? Um, so um, I'm all for purity of heart. I think it needs to be reconsidered. So. so I want to invite people here to do two things. Um, first, to join me in thanking you, Professor Radner, for making the contours of this problem sharper than they were for me before, for us, I think. So please uh, thank our speaker. <laughs> and uh, if possible, I want to invite you to return on Thursday I mean, the acuteness of the problem is felt. I hope the solution feels equally acute, or at least partly as acute. It's, it's just going to be so wonderful. I, I, you'll float out. You'll just float out. That's, that's what I want to say. Well, that's the promise. Uh, okay, come back for Thursday if you can online, if not in person. Thanks to all of you for being here very much. It's nice to gather in this yeah, way. Thank you.